Hi, I'm Kelly Vaughn, and this is Inside Indy. And boy, do we have a yummy topic for you tonight <laughs> here on Inside Indy. We're going to talk about a book uh, right here in central Indiana, from in central Indiana, called Hamilton County Food. Yes, I love it. And the author is Karen Kennedy, from Casual Grub to Gastro Pub. Right. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Karen. Well, thanks, Kelly. It's nice to be here. Wow, this is so cool. And I saw this on Facebook, people just, you know, chatting about it. Yeah. And there's all the buzz on, on Facebook. So tell us about Hamilton County Food, the book and beyond. Well, you know, it, the book is kind of a labor of love, um, as is running a restaurant. <laughs> oh, okay. So, so you, you run. A, what, I did. What, you I did. was in the okay. restaurant business for many, many years. Right. Um, so that was kind of one of my whys uh, for writing the book. I was approached to write the book by Arcadia Publishing, but the topic of independently owned restaurants is pretty near and dear to my heart because I was, I was an independent restaurant owner for many years. Okay. okay. So I know how hard it is. I know how much time mm. it takes. And um, I'm passionately committed to independently, restaurant, independently right. owned restaurants. So it was important to me to write a book that was exclusively about that. Okay. So what restaurant did you own? Well, I was in the restaurant business in Chicago for many oh, years, Chicago. also okay. in Vermont, and then in northern Indiana. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so tell us, tell us a little bit about the restaurant that you did run. What did you serve? What? Um, well, most of the restaurants that I was involved in were fairly high-end, um, fine mm. dining. Also here in, in the Indianapolis area, I owned a catering and event planning company called Small Potatoes oh, uh, okay. that I had just uh, sold in 2017. Um, and that was around the time that I was approached to write the book. And so apparently that was the next step for me. Okay, okay, okay. So uh, walk us through the book, what people can expect. We don't want to give it all away, right. obviously, but uh, tell us what we can, what, what food journey um, shall we be upon here? Well, you know, the book sort of starts back in the day when um, there weren't any restaurants in Hamilton County, like when William Connor first settled Hamilton County. Oh. Um, but then it was interesting because it was like, you know, first there were just travelers on horseback and they needed a place to stay. So there were inns, but the inns didn't have any food. And then the people needed to eat. So they realized they had to feed them and it just sort of evolved from there. And then the, the historical perspective of it all, where you see how restaurants restaurants evolved sort of out of necessity mm. um, and they just kept they kept having to be more and more creative you know it was like the the depression came along or prohibition or like oh, the war and all these different things came along and all these mom and pop restaurants were just reinventing themselves over and over and over again wow. trying to keep up with the time and find a way to make it through so wow. it was fascinating to me to see how the how they sort of struggled through the years and okay. you know here they are so now, any particular restaurants establishments here in Hamilton County that has been around forever. Do we know the longest running restaurant? Do we know that? I don't know about that. I mean, I honestly, I don't know if there would be a restaurant that is still standing today mm -hmm. that um, would go back as far as some of the restaurants that I researched, but there were some really cool ones. Um, there was a restaurant called The Glass Chimney in Carmel that was open for 30 years um, oh. on Old Meridian, a chef named Dieter Puska, who actually moved here from Austria and opened restaurants. He used to pal around with Wolfgang Puck back in the day. Oh, wow. So, yeah. And so um, The Glass Chimney closed um, in the Ooh, I'm not exactly sure when it closed, but it was uh -huh. open for 30 years. And wow. um, it was really influential in the whole restaurant scene in Hamilton County. It was back in a time when they were, you know, people were choosing between Salisbury steak and fried chicken on menus. And all of a sudden he's got escargot oh. appetizer for $13. And it was like, what's happening? Wow. So, um, and that restaurant now is uh, where the Brew Burger in Carmel is. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, now, when you you talk a lot about the, when this one closed, and so what's what's the reason that typically a restaurant would close? You know, I think sometimes a restaurant just has a lifespan. You know, in the way a TV series kind of has a beginning, a middle, and an end. I think that's true. Um, a lot of times, I feel like a restaurant 
uh, restaurant owners are undercapitalized from the start, you know, mm -hmm. um, or they, they're passionate about food, but they don't really understand the business end of it, you know, just because you make a mean lasagna <laughs> doesn't right. mean that you're meant to open an Italian restaurant. So is that where it typically starts from that, I, that the person has this just knockout uh, recipe is, is it, or is it somebody says, I just want to be in the food business. Um, I Where think, does it come from? I think it's a little of both. I mean, I think uh, people say, you know, you have to be crazy <laughs> to open a restaurant. So I suppose uh, yeah. that helps. It, would, it helped me. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, really people just, they dive in and they, they do it out of beautiful intentions. And, and I don't know if anyone who hasn't ever done it can understand how hard it is. Um, and that was one of the things that was important to me about the book, too, was sort of documenting what what these people do because you know if you if you try to research the history of just about anything else you can find all kinds of history mm -hmm. on significant events over the years but when you try to find pictures of a restaurant that a thousand people tell you was the place to go in wow. 1950 there's no documentation of it. Today, we document every meal we eat, right? Right, right exactly. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. oh, here's what I had on Instagram. Here's what I had, right. you know, here's what I had that, for dinner yeah. last night on Facebook. You know? <laughs> Not to mention all the reviews. Exactly. You know? <laughs> and, you know, it's a great way for chefs to get, their, to get their reputation out there. But back in the day, we didn't have any of that. We didn't have, you know, Yelp or any of the TripAdvisor or any place right. to tell us where to go. Um, there's a great story in the book that I found of... Um, a guy who was uh, on horseback, you know, way back when, in uh -huh. the early days of Hamilton County, and there was apparently one woman who made a really mean corn pone. <laughs> oh, wow. That was a corn pone? <laughs> yeah, so what just is like, that? Just a, corn, just a corn dish, like a, like a, mm, a, like a mix of corn and like just a like, a, like a grits, right? Like, okay. And so... He, he was hungry and he was looking for this corn pone. So he's riding around on his horse and he stops in one of the street corners and said, can you tell me where I can find that corn pone that I, and the, you know, so it was like Yelp on horseback, right? <laughs> <laughs> and the guy said, oh, That's yeah, it's the, it's the innkeeper it's the down, the down the road. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And he, he sent him on his way. Right. So, so they really were doing the same thing back then. It was just in a different way. Exactly, yeah. because everybody wants to know where the great restaurants right, are, right? right? Like if exactly. you're sitting somewhere in the dentist's office and someone starts talking about a restaurant and how they had a great meal, Nine times out of ten, someone's going to turn around and say, "I'm sorry, what what restaurant were you yeah. talking about? Uh, yeah, Where is that place?" Word of mouth, it right? Really is. And when a new restaurant opens, you know, especially here, I think this community is really great about supporting local, independently owned restaurants. Now, moving from the past to the present day, yeah. Uh, does a, so, what do you tell us in the book about what's happening happening with food in Marion County and restaurants and uh, Hamilton? In Right, yeah. yes. I did an Hamilton. interview earlier with right. Hendricks County, right. so I'm all over the place. Yes, <laughs> well, people who live in Marion County That's, should go to yeah, Hamilton yeah. County and eat. That's the next book, okay. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, because a lot of people in, who live in Marion County don't see any need to drive up to Hamilton County to eat, yeah. because there are a lot of great restaurants in Marion County, but I will say that there are certainly some restaurants in Hamilton County that are worth visiting, such as uh, in Carmel, um, there's a fantastic place called Divi. Divi. Uh huh. And uh, they serve small plates. It's owned by Woody and Rochelle Ryder. Uh -huh. And they also own Woody's Library, which is where the original Carnegie Library was oh, okay, in cool. Carmel. Okay. Um, there's a great place in Westfield called Michelangelo's Italian Bistro. Mm -hmm. There's Rosie's Place in Noblesville. Um, so many, it's, it's almost impossible. There are so many restaurants, great restaurants and Fishers, um, a lot of good ethnic food in Fishers. Actually, mm. there's a place called Cafe Korea on Allisonville road. That oh, is wow. amazing. Um, there's actually an Ethiopian restaurant that a lot of people don't know about called St. Yarid's over by Geist. Okay. So, so do you take us to some of these places we do. in the book? Yeah, I love but it. it's not a dining guide. You know, it's not just like here's the restaurant, here's the address, you know, here's the phone number kind of thing. It's, um, you know, he, these are the chefs, these are the owners. This is how the restaurant came to be. This is what the building used to be before it was this oh, restaurant. Wow. So, so a little bit of history. we try to like dig a little deeper and really um, g let people get to know uh, a little bit more about the restaurant and the people who run the restaurant. So we also do some culinary superstars. So uh -huh. people um, who really had an impact on the local scene or who opened restaurants that were noteworthy and 
oh, worth nice, visiting. Oh, nice, nice. I love it. I and then it ends it. with um, a foodie's perfect weekend in Hamilton County. Oh, good. Okay. With good. and without kids. Okay, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Kind of yeah. a staycation right here. Exactly. Right here at home. Well, you know, now this is one of my pet peeves about restaurants. I love my food hot. <laughs> And, and whether it's, it's exquisite dining, like some of the restaurants you have here, or if you're stopping at Wendy's, mm -hmm. and I stopped at Wendy's the other day, and I <laughs> ate a burger without the bun, you know, doing the low-carb thing, uh -huh. right? And I said at the drive-thru, I want it hot. Yeah. I get it. It's not hot. So what's <laughs> good? So I, and I thought, let me just call and find, talk to somebody to say, why can't they do what I asked them to do. So do you, having been in the restaurant industry for so many years, yeah. why, did that ha why didn't I get the hot burger? <laughs> well, I can't answer what they do at Wendy's. <laughs> I'm only about the, and they're not the, the only non ones. chain restaurant. They're not the only ones. <laughs> right. Because it's like you can get a hot White Castle and, a, and hot Chinese food. Right. But after that, it's like everybody likes lukewarm. And I really like my food hot. Yeah. I mean, really, all you can do, all, all I can say is that I feel like most restaurants just do the best they can. And, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy, you know, to serve that many people at one time. At one time, right. And um, so I think it's important to just, you know, express what you're after to your server and, you know, hope for the best. Okay. But as, as someone who's been in the trenches, I can say, you know, you can't hit it out of the park every time. <laughs> I feel like carrying my microwave right. around exactly. with me. So now how can we get the book? Hamilton County Food. So um, it's definitely available on Amazon and, you know, all the big uh, online venues. But I would certainly hope that people would look for it in the independently owned local places. So it's okay. available at Turn the Page Bookstore in Westfield. Uh, it's available at a couple of places in Carmel, um, Silver in the City and All Things Carmel, a couple of sweet little gift shops in downtown Carmel. Nice. Um, it's available at Connor Prairie Gift Shop. It's available at the Indiana Historical Society Gift Shop. So okay. lots of local places as okay. well. All over yeah. the place. I love it. And Barnes and Noble. Of course, of course. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you can't do it without them. Yeah. Hamilton County Food by Karen Kennedy. Thanks so much, Karen. Thank you, Kelly. It was a pleasure. For joining us on Inside Indy. And we'll be back here on Inside Indy with more after this. And we're back here on Inside ND. And when I say the church or the Bible study meeting or church service on Sunday, you probably think, wow, that's, that's nice and a nice safe place uh, to be. And typically they are, but they are not exempt uh, from uh, the unfortunate uh, acts of people who bring harm. And so what we're going to talk about on Inside Indy today, safety and security for religious facilities and houses of worship. And here uh, to uh, advise us and beyond is Doug Coons with Veracity IIR. Welcome to Inside Indy. Thank you. You know, it, it's we just don't really think about things like that happening, but we know that has happened in the news on a number of occasions in the last uh, it seems like in the last three or four years, uh, uh, more than we would like to Absolutely. happen. Um, steps religious institutions can take to try and mitigate impact and incident uh, in their church. So, so what, what brought this to the forefront of Veracity IIR? Well, over the past several months, I noticed in the news, and I'm particular, particularly in tune to these things from my background as an FBI agent, Several church, synagogue, mosque shootings, uh, both in the United States and around the world. Mm -hmm. And I thought it might be a good idea to have one of our analysts come up with a informational document that we could put out that would alert them to the potential dangers that we haven't had in years past mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and some of the steps that they can take to protect themselves. 
Wow. And you see that potential dangers that we haven't had in the past. So what is going on? And why do you think that is the case with it happening in a church? That was, that's the sacred, that's sacred ground. Right, that's a, right. It, and it's that, just not supposed to happen. And that's, that's the dilemma here. And, and the reason I wanted to put this out is, you know, really these safety tips could be applied to any institution, but a religious facility you think of as a warm place of comfort where you go, you welcome people to come in and join you. Everybody's welcome. Right. And, but nowadays people are a little bit afraid because of the things that are happening. And so how do you balance safety with that philosophy of come to us, mm -hmm. learn, worship? Okay. Because churches should be concerned about whatever is happening in the world, so to speak, so whether it be shootings, um, um, and then I was thinking of, um, oh, it was something else that came to my mind about the attacks on um, churches. You could be robbed. I've noticed that some of the churches I've attended recently, now they have security. A lot of them do, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So um, why do you think it's happening now in the church as opposed to it? That was the one place it didn't. Well, it's a, it's a big open facility. They're soft targets. They have a schedule. Uh, attackers know when there's going to be a large number of people at a given place at a given time. And I think that's part of it. I think part of it's ideology, misplaced anger, hatred. Uh, okay. There's a variety of reasons, a variety of motives. But uh, whatever that is, there are things that people who attend these places, whatever uh, faith that you're, you subscribe to can take to mitigate the risk okay, so uh, and, and hopefully still maintain that, that atmosphere that they desire. Okay, so what are some steps that we could take um, a religious facility or house of worship? What could they, well, they do? Well, uh, in our document, and it's uh, available on our website, but uh, it talks about forming a, a security team. I think a lot of churches or uh, any religious facility are going to have members of law enforcement that are, are members, uh, military, uh, emergency personnel, medical personnel, uh, people that might want to be involved in a security team. Mm, okay. and, and from that team, there are resources and there's links in the document as well that can help, or there are companies that will help you develop um, plans for the different threats that might arise, bomb threats, uh, active shooter, uh, even just fire, you know, typical stuff, fire, tornado, things that we, we have planned and practiced for. Uh, maybe we haven't planned and practiced for some of these other things. Mm. Who's gonna call 911? Who's gonna notify someone that's in the nursery or daycare that might be down the hall or in the basement and they don't know what's going on upstairs? Uh, things you can do to maybe change the configuration of your sanctuary uh, to make it a little bit risky. I think most people you, you go in, at least the churches I think of, uh, you sit down and your backs are to the entrances. Mm. And uh, so everybody except for the, the few people and maybe the choir over here uh, can't see what's going on behind them. Um, some simple security measures like uh, cameras. And some people say, well, let's put let's make them hidden cameras so we don't have this scary feeling that, uh, you know, we're, we're turning this into some sort of a... Um, like a SWAT watch or right, something. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, but if, when you hide the cameras, then you lose, so you gain that, that you're, you're not seeing that, but you're losing the deterrence effect that that might have on somebody that would have maybe come and vandalized your building. They see those cameras and they might think, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll look elsewhere, mm. or maybe well, I'll okay. double Okay, as a deterrent, yeah. Right. Okay. Wow. Uh, that sounds really good, and, and I was thinking about some kind of code if something is going on. Because you know how you're in a store and you hear them say things over the... Mm -hmm. uh, they're talking to each other, but you, I don't know what they're saying, and I don't know if they're... And sometimes I wonder, like, are they seeing something, or a shoplifter? They're alerting each other. Right. Because they'll say, cold, two, one. Right. <laughs> it's like, what are they, and, what are they having, talking about? Having been in law enforcement, I know when you go to certain special events, uh, you might wear a, a bracelet of a certain color, you know, like a, just one of those disposable plastic 
mm -hmm. uh, or, or uh, tape things that you put around. So you know who the other law enforcement people are there. Uh -huh. um, those are certain things you can do. And there might be a code where if there's something happening, uh, the, the leader of that congregation can, can, can say that. And if there's a plan that's been practiced, then people will, will then follow, they'll file out. Otherwise, without a plan, nobody knows what to do panic it, it makes it worse wow yeah it's a lot to think about with that many people and and that given space wow it's 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 really frightening and i so your advice then is for people obviously to take heed to these things but is there some place they can go to get this how does the leadership where do they go to get the training to get the information to well there's a variety of resources uh there's a lot online and those are detailed in our document. Mm -hmm. And then there are also companies, uh, I don't want this to be any kind of a, a advertisement or anything. There are companies like ours that will help you develop a program. Mm -hmm. um, okay. What you do is you sit down and, and try to brainstorm what are, what are the things that could happen and list those out. And now how do we react to those in the best way? And you know, there's not necessarily a right answer to all those things, but the thing you want to have is a plan of some sort. Uh, the only wrong answer is to not have talked about it and to not have a plan. And what about those who think, ah, oh, that'll never happen here? I think yeah. the, the time for that naivety is long gone. I, I think you have to believe it could happen anywhere, anytime. Okay, especially being um, with the whole, um, there's a lot of tension in, in, about religion in our society right now, whether it's Christians, Muslims, all this stuff going on. And so I would think, yeah, it would, would right. be a smart thing to and, do. And back to the motivation, sometimes I think uh, the opposing groups think that when they attack a religious facility, their desire is to create that dissent, that conflict, that it's going to fire up the others, and then they're going to retaliate, and then so on. That, that's what they want. So we can't play into that. Okay. Okay. And I, I see things on social media, you know, the, the New Zealand shooting, and then I think there was a retali retaliatory attack in, uh, was it Bangladesh? It's, there's been a, a few, or India. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the stuff that I see on social media that's just nonsense, that, you know, misplaced anger, uh, we have to avoid that. Right. So better safe than, than sorry. So we've got your information on the screen there if people want to um, get information from you. Um, but um, I really appreciate you coming in here because there are a lot of people who watch our ministries, including other ministries. Um, and I, I would guess that some of the ministries can just come together and come to you as a group and right. kind of knock it out. And I've heard of there being seminars with different churches are holding them and having other ministries come together. Right, exactly. And that, that's one of the, the points in the document that we put out is to form a working group, have leaders of the various religious facilities come together once a month, once a quarter, and talk about these security uh, issues and develop uh, best practices. And, and they might share ideas about, well, we do this, well, we do this, and, oh, I like that. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Together, they can develop better plans. More right. heads are better than one. Right, yeah, because I was sitting here thinking if I was sitting in church and then, you know, you saw something suspicious, what do you do in a case like that? Maybe nothing is going on actively, but, you know, as they say, you see something, say something, Absolutely. you know, how to react. And who do you, so who do you say it to? Right. When you're in church, is, do you know, is there a police officer there that you can go kind of whisper to? Do you need to step out and make a uh, phone call? Uh, you know, yeah. these are things that you need to think about before it happens. Okay. If this happens, here's what I'm going to do. Okay, so if you're a religious organization, church, you need to think about it, have a plan. Um, whether it's escape, prevention, the whole bit, yeah, you, need, you need to have that in place and don't think that... You, you can't think, oh, it'll never happen to me. I, right. I always feel like if you assume that something could, you know, you don't want to dwell on negativity, but eh, if it could happen, then you, it's better to be safe than sorry. So, right. Doug Coons of Veracity IIR, thanks so much for coming on and enlightening us. And we have your information on the screen, um, but we, we, we appreciate you ad advising our audience. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for joining us on Inside Indy.
I'm Kelly Vaughn. We'll see you next time. Be safe. Bye-bye.